our A party, which is originating from 717-566-4428, is calling 215-555-1978. Ultimately, the call setup is going to be hopping across this path, where this portion, at least that far, is going to be public switch telephone network. The remainder of the signaling path is going to be SIP. We'll talk about the interoperation right here. This is where the magic is going to occur. So our originating party goes off hook. We have 30 milliamps of current flowing and our user dials this phone number that you see over here on the right. So after the, di the digit 9215-555-1978 is dialed, a setup message is sent from the PBX to the end office. Now the setup message contains the calling party's number, the called party's number, and also the channel that the call is on. Now that the end office knows this information, it must make an autonomous decision based on this information. The decision that it makes is part of its routing table known as the dial plan. It has its own dial plan. It did not learn the dial plan from telephone switches that are adjacent to it like you would in an IP network where OSPF or uh, EIGRP, some other interior gateway routing protocol would have told it. That's not the case. In this particular case, a human being has to tell this switch how to route calls and the entry then made is a static routing table. In this particular case, let's say that our end office chooses this as the best path and it has 200 inner machine trunks to choose from. Let's assume that none of those trunks are busy right now. Well, our end office was provisioned to know that signaling system 7 point code 3.5.9 is how to talk to our next tandem switch. So an initial address message is sent. The initial address message specified is going to destination 3.5.9 from the originating point code 3.5.2. A signal transfer point, which looks more like a router really than a telephone device, simply responds to the destination point code 3.5.9 and relayed the initial address message to our tandem switch because it too is configured with a static routing table but this time the static routing table is for point codes it's not for telephone numbers so now our called telephone switch the third one in a row now knows the originating party's number the terminating party's number, and it also knows that the call is on channel identification code 19. It must make a routing decision based on its dial plan, and its decision is to send an initial address message to our next telephone switch. Well, to our tandem switch, it thinks the next telephone switch is a PSTN, or Public Switch Telephone Network, TDM switch, and using signaling system 7, the message is sent to 3.5.3. And now our first switch that begins the voice over IP network knows the originating party's number, the terminating party's number, and it knows the calls on channel identification code 22. Now it's time to talk about these little termination points. These little termination points are known as a termination. Specifically, these are physical terminations, and they are patched together with a a logical or a digital patch cord so that these two terminations interconnect in a context. So we'll have a context right here. There'll be a context in the PBX. And in fact, uh, right now we have three and a half of them. But we begin the SIP networking now. The session initiation protocol invite is sent first from our tandem switch is really what this red, this yellow switch is, to a back-to-back -back user agent. This would be a feature server that happens to know the whereabouts of our called number because prior to this, this end user registered. So the IP address or the domain of our destination is known by the feature server. The feature server simply relays the SIP invite to where the registration came from. Now a session border controller is going to make modifications to the invite, making it appear as though the invite originated from the outside of the session border controller.
What you should know is that a session border controller has two interfaces, one facing in, which usually has a private address, one facing out, which has a public address. So when the invite arrives at the session border controller, the session border controller completely rewrites the invite, making it appear as though it's brand new, popping out the outside interface, effectively deceiving the called party into thinking that the call actually originated from the session border controller. And this is exactly the way we want it. This allows the session border controller to hide the rest of the network from our outside called party. So we would have an untrusted and a trusted side of the session border controller. Now there's another thing you should know about the SIP invite which originated here and ultimately relays to the destination. The SIP invite contains session description protocol. Now session description protocol is describing a termination, a special kind of termination known as an ephemeral termination. This is where RTP traffic is going to originate and terminate for this phone call. This termination, again, described by session description protocol, must be attached, all this information that's contained in SDP, must be attached to the SIP invite. So when the SIP invite, effectively backpacking session description protocol, passes through the session border controller, the session border controller rewrites session description protocol, making it appear as though the ephemeral termination is on the outside of itself. This is going to cause our called party to send voice to the border controller. The called party will never send voice into the soft switch, which has an embedded media gateway because it does not know about that. In the response to the SIP invite, the called UA responds ultimately with a SIP 200. This indicates that the call was answered, and most likely this contains session description protocol. I say most likely because there could have been a 183 response prior to this that would contain session description protocol. We don't know that right now. So let's just skip to we've answered the call and session description protocol describing this end is passed back. Well, session description protocol describing this end is backpacked onto the 200 response, which effectively backtracks the path that the SIP invite has taken. So ultimately, the response makes it all the way back to the soft switch with embedded media gateway. This is going to permit voice to travel from the media gateway to the border controller, from border controller to destination. So we actually have two separate ephemeral pathways from the media gateway to the inside of the border controller and from the outside of the border controller to the call destination. The border controller will patch these two ephemeral terminations inside of itself forming a context which was created completely under the session border controller's control. Now in all of this please understand the session border controller is forcing itself into this particular call to make sure that it hides the inside from the outside and also the outside from the inside. By making it become an RTP relay, where RTP is the voice, not the signaling, and it also is a session initiation protocol back-to-back -back user agent, uh, this is a special kind of a SIP device which has complete control, not only routing, but originating, terminating, and any other aspect of the call which it wants to modify in, in any way, it certainly can. So we would look at the control plane as from soft switch to a back-to-back -back user agent, from back-to-back -back user agent to border controller on the inside, from border controller on the outside to our called UA. The media path is going to be coming on the outside to border controller on the inside to our originating media gateway. The, the soft switch in this case is not interested one bit in hearing what is being said. It only wants to control the setup and tear down of the call. So now that the call is actually in place, we have this blue path, if you will, it's all the way back to the originating party, and the control path, which I'll remind you uh, in, using the red color, 
You use the ISDN Q931, the signaling system seven messages. The SIT messages that you see was all part of the control plane. And in this particular illustration, we have a clear separation between the control plane and this blue stuff or the bearer. The result would be that voice packets start to form just like this. So we see samples coming in at 8,000 samples per second. Enough samples are captured until we have an adequate amount. Normally 20 milliseconds is the favored amount. So we capture 20 milliseconds of sound right there and then pass it onward towards the destination. This particular flow is showing call uh, information, showing the voice going in this direction. We're not showing the voice going in the other direction for simplicity, but believe me, it would be occurring. So there you have an example of how SIP, RTP, Session Description Protocol, interoperate with the public switch telephone network. We have other examples just like this one to show other call scenarios in an attempt to make it crystal clear, the big picture of how SIP interoperates within the public switch telephone network. We'll do the same with presence, we'll do instant message, and just about everything else that SIP is controlling these days, even video.